Sometimes history doesn't reveal the full buried truth of an individual's life here at James Fort. In today's episode of Dig Deeper, I'd like to focus on one of Jamestown's hidden figures that you may not know about, but was very instrumental in everything that we dig up here at Jamestown. So the hidden figure that I'd like to talk about is Edward Mariah Wingfield. He was president of the colony uh, when it was first set here, and he's one of the forgotten figures of American history. So we have thousands of visitors from America and all over the world come here, and they see this monument here in our memorial church that talks about Edward Mariah Wingfield. And the usual reaction is, wow, I didn't know this person in history. And there's, there's kind of a reason for that. Now, Edward, as, as it says here on the plaque, was a seasoned veteran of foreign wars, both in Ireland and the Lowlands. And that would play principally into the formulation of the triangular fort here at Jamestown. Being a seasoned veteran, uh, Wingfield was around 57 years old uh, when he was here, he first arrived at Jamestown and many of the other gentlemen soldiers were in either in their late 20s or late 30s. So he was, he was pretty old actually at the time and was, was looked up to by many of the men and that's why he was elected as president of the council. Now, there was initial argument, you could say here when the, the colonists first landed. The company had said, do not build a fortification because the Virginia Indians will know that you're here to stay. And Smith argued for them building a fortification, worried about violence uh, against the, the company, uh, the 104 colonists that were here. And uh, after a few weeks, the, the colony was attacked. Uh, several people lost their lives. And Smith won out that argument and be became very popular with the men. And maybe is why you see a statue of him on site here today. But Mariah Wingfield, being the seasoned veteran, actually designed the fortification. And if you look very closely at the shape and the layout, it's very elegant. There are three gun emplacements, one at each corner of the fort, providing sweeping or overlapping fields of fire. Additionally, there are bulwarks or ditches that go around those sweeping uh, fields of fire and are to protect the fort against a cavalry attack, essentially. Now, we have three, three sides that you can be attacked on. The river side, what would become Newtown or James City, and then Smithsfield, where John Smith drilled the troops. The reason we don't have a fourth side is there's an impassable swamp on the north side of the fortification. So I'm standing here in the east bulwark of James Fort, and we're facing downriver, so the Atlantic Ocean is out that way. And the reason this was chosen over Archer's Hope, which is about seven miles around the uh, end of the island here, is uh, it's, it's low lying uh, and has a nice long view shed. So you can see no one's going to sneak up on this fortification. It would take forever for a, a ship to come up uh, in the wind up to this point. But also the cannons like this one here would be elevated to fire upon any incoming ship. In other words, the trajectory would be a low arc. Now, Wingfield's actually the one who chose this spot over Archer's Hope, and it's actually a very elegant fortification. We're currently excavating in the area. In the late 90s, we dug over uh, just to the east here of me, and we're able to trace out the fortification, but we actually don't know what this gun emplacement fully would have looked like. There's a, a lot of competing uh, uh, ideas about what that would look like, but we think that it might be a little bit more elaborate than what we initially thought. So over the course of the next few years, we'll be digging out in front here, digging down and figuring that out. And this dig will be a testament to Mariah Wingfield's uh, foreign service in Ireland and the Lowlands. 
two and a half centuries later, the Confederates would put Fort Pocahontas in the exact same spot as James Fort, which testifies to this location as being an excellent military control point for traffic coming up the James River. So shifting gears a little bit, I'm here in our archaeological museum, the Archaearium, here on Jamestown Island, and I'm holding a 3D print of a lot of the staff members' favorite artifact. And uh, this was printed by Bernard Means at the Virginia Commonwealth University. Um, he came in and 3D scanned and printed these, but this is a caltrip. And a caltrip is meant to as a defensive weapon and that you throw it on the ground and it lands point side up. Now this is meant to lame cavalry horses uh, and it stands testament that Edward Mariah thought uh, or, were, or was intending that the Spanish would attack James Fort. Now we find these thrown away down in the bulwark ditches and quickly the arms and armor being adapted to fighting almost like a guerrilla warfare with the Virginia Indians. Now one of the last things I'd like to point out is this panel in our archaeological museum that features a lead wing fragment we found which we believe to be part of Edward Mariah's crest and may have belonged uh, to Edward Mariah, might have been on a piece of leather or a piece of uh, furniture, uh, but it, goes, it stands testament to the fact that sometimes we do find things uh, that belong to some of these famous people in history and sometimes they're more abstract concepts. Edward Mariah left in 1608 and died in 1613 back in England. And so much of what we know about his history is written through John Smith's eyes. And this example highlights the role of historical archeology span in bridging both personal biographies of individuals and the archeology span to tell our past. So we hope in the future that we'll be continuing this part of the Dig Deeper series and focusing on some of Jamestown's hidden figures.